place. Sorry if I, 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 had, I was uh, a little bit longer, but that's just to be uh, in, in time. Uh, thank you, Dr. Osama, and I hope I'm, uh, I wasn't too long. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, actually, we didn't notice that you, you, you took too much because it was so interesting. It's a beautiful demonstration. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, if uh, I were the decision maker, I would extend your presentation one hour more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and now let's move to the fundamentals of endoscopic ear surgery with Dr. Osama Al-Husseini um, talking about the tips and instrumentation. Osama, unmute yourself and go ahead. Kareem in the control room, can we uh, start? Yeah. Good evening, dear professors and doctors. I'm Osama Mutwali, lecturer of otorhinolaryngology head and neck surgery at Kasserlain School of Medicine, Cairo University in Egypt, and member of the international and Egyptian working groups on endoscopic ear surgery. I'm hoping all of you enjoy our scientific day today and lectures and have a nice time. Okay, so let's start. The Egyptian Working Group on Endoscopic Ear Surgery was established under the umbrella of the Egyptian Otorhinolaryngology Society in 2018. Its main aim is to enhance the usage of the endoscope among the Egyptian otorhinolaryngologists through organizing different scientific events, hands-on training sessions, and lectures. In this presentation, we are going to discuss different difficulties, or let's name it, handicaps associated with usage of the endoscope in endoscopic ear surgery and how to overcome all of them. Also, we are going to give a hint on special instruments which are modified to facilitate the usage of the endoscope in ear surgery. So I'm hoping to enjoy my presentation. I'm sure many of you will be surprised if we said that endoscopic ear surgery is not a recent procedure. Actually, it started about 40 years ago. Yeah, the usage of the endoscope in, in, in ear surgery started about 40 years ago in simple procedures like ventilation tubes insertion. Then it is used in tympanoplasty. Nowadays, endoscope is widely used in management of attic refractions small cleisteatoma, stabdotomy, management of chromas tympanicum, or acoustic neuroma. Of course, this is being helped by the rapid improvement in the imaging uh, technique uh, and usage of high-definition camera or 4D cameras, which makes the quality of images in, in the scope ear surgery is more superior or more perfect than those images seen in the microscope. Let's start by roughly speaking about the advantages of endoscopic ear surgery over the microscope. Needless to say that the endoscope provides a wide panoramic view of the middle ear cavity in comparison to the narrow view provided by the microscope. Also, using the endoscope help us in seeing hidden areas, or let's name them, saying around the corners of the middle ear cavity, including the facial recess, sinus tympani, anterior tympani, mistaken tube orifice, round window niche, without or with very minimal wound removal, thus helping in decreasing residual disease and rate of recurrence. Also, endoscopic ear surgery is less invasive than the microscope, 
as we avoid the need to make a posterior incision through entering the ears through natural arches. And believe me, in will experience hands, the endoscope is more faster and even more easier than the routine exclusive microscopic ear surgery. In spite of the many advantages provided by the usage of endoscopes in ear surgeries, these evolving techniques are suspected to have some limitations or least call it handicaps, which can be summarized in the following points. First, endoscopic ear surgery is a single-handed technique, which is the most important handicap, especially for beginners with endoscopic surgeries. And it means that the surgeon requires one hand to hold the endoscope and the other one to perform surgery, which limits the possibility of by manual manipulation of tissues, which is possible using the traditional operating microscopes. Trials to overcome such an important handicap lead to the development of endoscopic holders and special modified instruments specific for endoscopic ear surgery to do both shows of suction and dissection, and they will be discussed later in the presentation. Also, careful control of hemorrhage during the endoscopic ear surgery is very difficult as one hand is holding the endoscope while the other should do both jobs of dissection and suctioning of the blood. However, there are a number of very simple techniques which can be used to reduce the amount of bleeding within the operative field, including usage of adrenaline soft cotonoid packs to do hemostasis or vast construction of the blood vessels within the ear cleft. Also, continuous saline irrigation with suction can control bleeding. And in cases of persistent bleeding within the operative field, we can use time, which is often by packing off the ear canal for about five minutes with adrenaline soft cotonoid and this time to the hemostasis. And this may be a very good option in cases of bleeding and taking this time to harvest the craft material. Also, we can inject uh, the subcutaneous tissue of the external artistic canal with uh, one over 200,000 epinephrine to perform hemostasis before starting surgery. One of the difficulties of endoscopic ear surgery is accidental patient movement during endoscopic ear surgery, which may result in secondary traumatic injury by the tip of the endoscope to the middle ear structure or oscillates. However, the usage of a relatively large diameter of the endoscope, about four millimeter, and the anatomy of the ear canal and middle ear space will usually limit the introduction of the endoscope beyond the tympanic rank. Another difficulty includes the size limitations of the ear canal, as narrow canal may be very challenging to, under, to undertake the endoscopic ear surgery. A number of techniques may help, like uh, cretage that can be used to enlarge the ear canal for improved the access, also, a stitch can be taken in the tragus and another one in the conica to straighten the opening of the external artery meters. We call it trapezius stitch, as, uh, as it will be seen in the image provided. Fogging of the endoscope is quite common for the endoscope to become fogged with condensation. This can be explained because of the endoscope is cold and the moist air found in the ear canal causes the tip of the lens to film up. This problem can be solved by keeping the endoscope warm before starting the surgery. The use of high quality and fog solution is important once the surgery 
is undergraduate. There is some difficulties with specific ear surgeries as in possession of a prosthesis, the unavailability of both hands and the lack of deep perception, assessing the length of prosthesis needed make this task more difficult to use in the scope. Also in training of the foot plate of steps during subtotomy, the ability to visualize the adequate length of training is difficult. However, those difficulties are neglectable in experience with trained hands. Finally, there is loss of depth perception and binocular vision in endoscopic ear surgery. However, with, exper with the experience, the surgeon usually interacts with the tactile and visual inf information he received during surgery to reconstruct a three-dimensional view of the operative side. Now let's give a rapid hint on special instruments which are modified for endoscopic ear surgery. At first, regarding the endoscope, we prefer to use three millimeter endoscope, 16 centimeter in length, we use both zero and 30 degrees. We prefer the three millimeter endoscope because it gives the same image provided by the four millimeter and the size is smaller, facilitating the job within the middle ear. Also, as it will be discussed in different surgeries provided later by my colleague, we may need to do some pony work within the middle ear to help or to facilitate the surgery. For this job, we use the piezo surgery. The piezo surgery is ultrasound based device invented by uh, or invented in Italy with steps of different sizes or shapes or angles, as we see in the image. It uses the ultrasound waves for bone removal, okay? Without affection of any soft tissues within the middle ear. The difficulty related to endoscopic ear surgery being a single-handed technique has arised the idea of using endoscope holders as we see in the image. However, those endoscopic holders are difficult in, uh, in adjusting fine angles of the endoscope, not like our hands when holding it. Also, it increases the risk of injury or traumatic injury to middle ear structures if accidental patient movements occur during light anesthesia. So they are not widely used and many of the surgeons prefer to hold the endoscope with one hand and doing the whole surgery with the other hand. So far comes a problem of doing the section with suctioning of the blood within the ear cavity using one hand has arised the idea of using the sectors with different angles and with suction tip to do both, both two jobs at the same time. As we see in the image, those are uh, different sectors with uh, angled tips to lock or to use them in the corners within the middle ear cavity with different angles like 45, 19, 110, uh, special dissection tip for sinus tympani. Uh, all of them are with suction tip to do both shelves at the same time. Also, we use a round knife with suction tip. So making dissection and control of bleeding or suctioning of the blood at the same time, more easier with them. From before, we can say that there is a continuous challenge in clearing care for endoscopic ear surgery, 
as being a single-handed technique as a result of also binocular vision in comparison with optic microscope. In addition, endoscopic surgery is proceeded at very narrow space. The trisurgical field is required, but it's difficult to provide suction while containing the section at the same time. But actually, believe me, or practically speaking, all of the aforementioned discussed issues are completely neglected for problem which will experience trained hands. So make your choice. And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Usama. Thank you nice so much, uh, doctors and professors, for your attendance and waiting for any questions. Thank you. Uh, we we'll leave the questions uh, at the end or to the end of the session if there are any. And now we will proceed. Uh, okay, at the end of the session. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Please uh, keep uh, be with us. Okay. Don't leave. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm present. Yeah. I'm present here. Okay. And uh, now we we'll move to our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Ahmad Hisham Galel uh, from Alexandria University, who will be speaking about preoperative imaging in cholesteatoma. Uh, Dr. Ahmad. Hey, Dr. Sami. Uh, hello, everybody. I have my lecture already uh, recorded with the system, and I will be here for any questions. So uh, I think it's already loaded. If there's any problem, I can start live. Okay, thank you. Until uh, they start, I'd like to introduce you, Dr. Ahmed, to the audience. You are one of our rising stars in Alexandria University. He was well trained in Alexandria and in Italy. So, uh, uh, so are expecting good lecture from him, uh, as he is always doing good work in the department. Welcome, Thank Dr. You. Ahmed. Thank you, Dr. Sam. Thank you very much. Until they uh, provide us with the, the presentation, uh, may I ask everybody, uh, if you have any question, please, you have uh, the, the part, uh, the division of Q&A, this is question and answers. We had already one question to Dr. Hamad al-Din and he uh, answered it. Uh, you can find the answer uh, in, the, in the tab. If you just tab on the answer, you will find the question and the answer. However, if you like to keep your questions uh, and the speakers, they might um, answer it uh, uh, in the session here for everybody. So both are available for us. And I hope now uh, that we, that the issue is solved. Not yet, Karim? Yes, please. Good morning, dear doctors, or good evening. My name is Ahmad Galel. I'm a lecturer and consultant at the Faculty of Medicine at Alexandria University. Uh, my topic today is about uh, imaging, role of, a little bit of a different role of imaging in cholecystoma surgery and affecting its the decision making. This is a part of our work. Uh, we did at our university. It was the thesis of a senior resident, Dr. Mohammed al uh, together with Dr. Bajadin as the head of the research unit, the research uh, group. Professor Dr. Ahmed Oman, Professor Votor in Golgi, and of course, our professor of radiology, uh, Professor Dr. Mohammed Aid, who helped a lot. And without him, we are all Votor in Golgi. We could have not 
have done this study. Uh, the classification of colegiate that works right now, or we based our study on our work, is the Ianojo's classification, the consensus for staging middle year colegiatomas. It divides the year into compartments where the tympanic part, the middle year is called tympanic part T. We have the attic, which ends by the short process of the incas at the level of the atrium, the centricular canal, and then whatever was is. Uh, deeper is would be the mastoid after the anthem. We um, have two difficult sites, which is S1, and S2, the sinus. The staging, it's stem, based on the letters above. One site, one subsite is stage one, two or more is stage two. And if there are extracranial complications, it would be called three, and intracranial complications, it would be called four. The role of imaging in colesiatoma, the different types of imaging used, or there's the CT. It's the whole mark, the, the most commonly used, our mainstay. We don't do, never do surgeries without it. There's the classical MRI, T1, T2, and post contrast. Of course, it is not that useful for colesiatomas. The late contrast MRI, it has been used to detect the granulation tissues and the tissues that absorb the contrast slowly, especially that the middle ear itself is fully uh, vascularized. So we use a delayed contrast, three, four hours of contrast uh, to do the MRI later on. Uh, of course, it's not practical and it has contrast. The diffusion weighted images, we have the EPI, then later on was developed the non-EPI diffusion MRI, which is the best to detect cholesterols. It is non-contrast and it's specific and sensitive for Regarding the CT, of course, we all know it has a very high spatial resolution, very fine and technical bony anatomy. However, it is not specific, which means that opacifications in the mastoid can be anything. Generation tissue, polyps, fibrosis in cases of revision. It can be just simple glue, a middle ear effusion. So it's very difficult to know. However, we have a very, very good detailed anatomy. This is the delayed contrast. Here's the cholecytoma, it doesn't take any contrast at all, however, no, no matter it's delayed or not. And here we have that granulation tissue has a delayed. This is the non API, and this is the EPI. So the non API MRI is better because it can. Smaller size cholecytomas and has lower incidence of artifacts, and it has a shorter time. Plus, generally speaking, in diffusion, we do not need any contrast, so it is not. cumbersome to add this investigation. So we have two questions. To be answered, is it a colesitoma or not? This is very well answered by the non-EPI diffusion with the images. But where exactly is the colesitoma? is mainly answered by, by CT. So we need to combine both. If you use both together, we can obtain like the same idea of the that CT scan, we can obtain very good anatomical localization, and yet we are sure it is cholecytoma by the specificity of the MRI. We have a cholecytoma in the sinus tympan.
supertuber uses and the epitemporum, and we can know it for sure and preoperatively. So the classification does not. need to be post-interoperative classification. We can know it beforehand. So we do a non contrast city, non-conscious, non contours fusion with the images, MRI, non-EPI, to fuse them together and the fusion by uh, uh, um, a good radiologist specialized in uh, in otolaryngology it will not take much time Another picture CD, we have open CD, we don't know, this is polyp diffusion. Cholecytoma, even tumor, you cannot know. And here. We know there is cholecytoma now by the diffusion, but only when we Use them together that we can know that there is a cholecytoma that is passing the enter and reaching the mastoid. We can know that there is some parasitic nephroid affection. So we can here say that there is an M There's an T infection for the panic. There's an A for ethic, there's an M for mastoid, and there is S. For sinus tamponoid, you can say it that comfortably and before surgery. Our results we're still working on publish it, but whatever the whatever the results reach now that Common site for the cholecytoma affection was the ethic followed by steroid. Sinus tamponade was the least common. This is the anticipation after the fusion of diffusion and CD was very high, except for sinus tamponade, mostly because of the mural lesion where there's only the lining, the perimetrics, or Binding cyst wall, and also because of the smaller lesions. Uh, stage two was the most common stage. Sensitivity and specificity for stage two was very high. Corisito was passing the enter and reaching the mastoid. Okay, the 70 percent of our, and this is the. Important thing that can affect our surgical decision that in these 70% of patients, all these patients, we started, of course, classically routine with endoscopic dissection. In the year. In all these cases, it passed the enter. And we needed to do a post -reparative. So here we can know that we need a post season before surgery, whereas by determining that it's passing the enter. Example of cases, this is a case where there's an opacity here. 
when you put the call the diffusion. Diffusion when you fuse them together, you know that all all the the rest was just fluids and secretions. I knew of course the tumor was here, just anterior to the oscars. This is a totally endoscopic, not passing the antrum, most is going to be endoscopic. So we have here the handle of medius, and here are the debris of polycytoma going anterior to the oscars, as we expected beforehand from the CT. Here is the cholecytoma going anterior to the oscars. And the rest of the ear was free. And the rest of the recesses were free. In another case, we find here still a pain opacification. We have no details whatsoever. On the type of the lesion. Here we know there is a cholecytoma. After the fusion, we know that there is a sinus lymphomatic infection and there is a supratubular infection. But there is an S1 and S2 infection. To the middle of the flap for this right ear, we find the cholecytoma here going to the right temporal. Sinus tympanoi, you can see here the cholecytoma that's going anterior towards the eustachian tube. <laughs> anterior to the malleus, exactly as we saw on the MRR. Here's the malleus, here's the strip of cholecytoma anterior to it. Here after cleaning, this is the envelope minute. This is the minute here. It's the round window and this is the minute. Last case. Oh. 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 يعني هو لو اتكلم هيظبط؟ اه يعني طيب طيب طب واللي بعد كده؟ You can see a cholecytoma that is passing بص 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 لو لو اللي بعد لو اللي بعديها نسجلها ناخد الاسئله والاجوبه لغايه ما هو يظبط احنا كده اوريدي لا احمد ده يخش في 5 minutes يقول الكونكلوجن بتاع بتاعه يلا لا لا انت كتر الله على طول ما هو تقدم قبل كده قدمه سامي قدمه لا 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 Similarity of the mastoid star. Here's the letter semicircular canal, here's the end. So we do the posterior incision and we did not regret it. And we know now, after we open that the mastoid is filled with cholestoma that was impossible to be removed through the endoscope and posterior incision and the microscopic use of the use for chloroform Sodectomy was essential. We cleaned the antrum, we put the endoscope into antrum and make sure everything is clean. So what affected our surgical incision here, the most in the study is 
what the consumer is passing the enter or not. If not, we do the total scope. If yes, still we explore the middle ear through and look in its recesses and clean it through the endoscope, but so we are stopped for the technical error and uh, Dr. Ahmed Galal will give us a brief of the presentation in uh, four or five minutes. That's because of the technical error we're facing now. Uh, please, Dr. Ahmed. Dr. Ahmed Galal. Yes, yes, I'm here. If you allow me to change yeah. my screen, I can give a quick summary. For the yes, lecture. in five minutes, yes. Is my screen visible now? Yes, yes, Ahmed, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Okay. okay, so after the acknowledgements, we said that we are depending on the Yanagos classification for the cholecystoma surgery, the STEM, and it's, it's, it's self-explanatory, it's already, it's already there. The whole idea of our work is to be able to localize this, not interoperatively, not postoperatively, but beforehand, before surgery. That was the whole idea of the work we're doing. So uh, we know, of course, we need the CT, MRI, delayed MRI need contrast, and they're not very practical. We have the API and MRI, diffusion-weighted images, and then the non-API, which has a little bit of advantages over the other one. Uh, um, over the non-API that has a, it can define, identify smaller cholecystomas and uh, has less artifacts. So to conclude, this is the best in MRI that we use non-EPI diffusion. Little time, no need for contact and CT. So the CT, we have the bony anatomy, we have the bony details, but we have non-specific opacifications. It can be anything, fluid secretions or polyps, uh, but it can do the wear. But is it cholecystoma or not? This can be done by the non-EPI MRI. So the idea, which is, of course, to be done before, we're not the first to do it, but the, the, the base of our work is to fuse them together. So we can make sure that there is a cholecystoma, and with this bony atom of the CT, we can know for sure where it is. So we have, for example, here, for the small cholecystoma in the sinus tympani, anterior epitempanum, and supratubular recess, we can define it before surgery, and we can, we can give an accurate classification before we start our surgery. So we do the CT non contrast an API uh, diffusion MRI, and our radiologist does the fusion between them. Here we have a non-specific opacity in the CT. We have no details, but here we can see, we can know that there's this cholecystoma, but you cannot know exactly where. And with the CT here, with the combination here, we have the supratubal and the, the attic, and we know that it's, and has an hourglass configuration and goes into the mastoid cavity. Here we have a small spot in the sinus tympani. We know sinus tympani is active. So results, the most common site was the epic, uh, followed by the mastoid. Sinus tympani was not that common. Uh, the sensitivity and specificity was very high, except for sinus tympani. We, uh, the explanation for this is mostly because it has newer polycytomas with only wall, with no cavity, with no matrix to be seen. Uh, and of course, also because it's a small lesion. Lesions uh, less than three millimeters are difficult to uh, to detect, and the staging, of course, was very good. The most important thing that affected uh, decision making of surgery actually was if is the cholecystoma passing the anthem or not. Because if the cholecystoma passing the anthem, the passing the circular canal, it means that it passes the abilities or the limits of the endoscopic surgery. And we have to do a postcolecular incision, we have to do the mastoidectomy, we have to um, to do a microscopic dissection, and we have to do a surgical incision. We cannot do it all trans canal. We'll skip the examples for the sake of time. The most important, the third one, the third example, where we have here the pan opacification, of course, and we have cholecytoma that is passing the enter. Based on this, we did our dissection. We cleaned, we did a big atipotomy. Here's the fiction nerve, here's the medius, the head is removed, the incus is removed, stapes is removed. We have the whole epitemporum for us, and it looks like it's clear and there's no cholecytoma. But based on what we have seen in the endoscopy, in the MRI beforehand, we know that it's causing the enter. So we did a postericular incision and we found cholecystoma in the mastoid cavity. This cholecystoma can cannot be reached by endoscopy. So 
So we had to revert to endoscopic dissection, a microscopic dissection, and a postracular incision. And yeah, after cleaning, and we can even use the endoscope through the enter of the mastoid cavity and to make sure that the cholesterol is cleaned from this area. So what really affected our decision is the cholecytoma with the fusion passing the enter or not, because most of the time, if it's not passing, in all our cases, we do not need a postracular incision. And when it passed, it coincided with the same findings in surgery, and we had to do a postracular incision. It's very important to prepare ourselves and to prepare the patient, and we have a good consultation for the postracular incision. So my conclusion is to be quick that the fusion can help us a lot to combine the benefits of CT and the benefits of the soft tissue identification of the fusion with the images for the cholecytoma. Mural cholecytoma, smaller cholecytomas can be missed. Uh, but generally speaking, it is very helpful in the, uh, in the staging and in the finding the subsite of uh, cholecytoma is a very promising tool and it can be improved later on with more surgical expertise and radiological expertise. The precautions is whatever happens, you have to have always your drill and your microscope ready for a case of post incision or you need more dissection. Uh, even if the results are very good, but still you can, you should also all the time have a consent for a posterior incision, just in case you don't reach the cholecytoma and need a mastoidectomy, the patient must have the consent. You don't get absolute promise of a transcanal surgery and then do an unconsented uh, uh, posterior incision uh, without the permission of the patient or to stop there and leave cholecytoma. Even if the, if the images is, has good qualities, you have to be uh, pragmatic, systematic, and check all your deep recesses, the sinus tympani, the sinus subtympanicum, the subparameter recesses, and all the tympani for tympanum, and tympanum and ethic, and you have to make sure the angled endoscopes, even if it's negative on endoscope, on uh, CT diffusion, and uh, the diffusion, and even the fusion between them, you have to make sure to check your recesses with your endoscope. Do not rely on the uh, images uh, as 100%.